Welcome, welcome. Let's make sure you are muted. So just click, I'm gonna let you click mute this time on your own self so that you can learn how to do that. Um, so please join in and then mute yourself. Um, I'm not sure how to tell you how to do that, but on mine, I just go hover over my own face and then I can click mute just by hovering over my screen of myself or wherever your name is. So I'm gonna do it for you, Benedict, maybe, maybe I'm not. <laughs> I don't know, yours won't mute. Marina, Marina's muted. Now Benedict's muted. And let me share my screen. I guess I am sharing my screen. Okay, welcome to Art Appreciation. Uh, today is the day of Eric Fischel and Edward Munch. Um, just mute. Uh, Leslie, I don't know if you can see mute, muting yourself, but I can't mute you for some reason. So if you can mute you, that is great. I don't see the button. Um, hi, Michael, if you can also mute yourself. Some of you I can't mute, I don't know why. Uh, but it doesn't show for me. So you've got to try to mute yourself. I'm going to try to make this me in the corner. And here we are. So just to notice if you were trying to find it, just you just click on the link I sent you. But also if you click here on spring 2019, you have to go to the wrong date, 228, because I switched them around on accident last week. So uh, this is the class that we're looking at. I sent you a handout, which is Eric Fischel and Edward Munch. Um, I'm going to call him Edward, probably, even though I know it's Ed Edfudge. I don't have the accent. You all can help me out. <laughs> if uh, There we go. Now I can mute you. Now I can mute you. Wonderful. So let's take a look at what we have here. We're going to look at some images. How do I make this into... Expensive PowerPoint. So let's talk about Eric Fischel for a minute. He was born in 1948 in New York. He um, grew up in the suburb, suburbs of Long Island, and then his art education took place in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and then he went to California Institute of the Arts in 1972. Um, that's commonly known as Cal Arts. And I um, it's a pretty good school. I went and visited it. I know a few people who went there. Some great artists have come out of there. So we'll probably be hearing more about that school if it hasn't come up already. Uh, so he spent time in Chicago as well because he said he wasn't really ready for the New York art world at the time. So he moved himself to Chicago after he getting his bachelor's, de or, yeah, bachelor's degree. And um, he started working in a museum, which he said was great because he was surrounded by wonderful art all day. And what Chicago did for him was it sort of helped him get into a bigger and bigger city. If you're not born in New York City and you don't know that lifestyle, I mean, it's a big, huge change. Take it from someone who, who knows, especially, I mean, I guess he grew up in uh, New or born in New York City and grew up in Long Island. And he's still now, uh, he's moved back to, um, right outside of New York, and he lives in Long Island with his wife, and her name is uh, oh Sag Harbor, New York, with his wife, who's also a painter named April Gornick, and she's a landscape painter. Um, so, wait, a couple of you need to be muted. Okay. So she's a landscape painter, and um, so they have a very interesting life together. They're very, uh, two painters living together. I don't know if any of you are uh, artists married to artists, but it can be a very interesting situation, and you have to be very careful not to compete with each other. But she said, you know, they met in school and um, at CalArts, I believe. So their love is pretty, I think it's pretty, uh, what's going on with my printer here? Sorry about that. It's deciding to talk to us. Um, and then we have, uh, so he, you know, he lived a good life. He's alive and well. He's one of the most successful living artists today. Um, he is a figure painter. So, you know, there's always 
there's always this balance, or rather maybe I'll call it a fight, between figurative and abstract painters, and is painting dead, and does figure painting matter anymore, and does narrative painting matter anymore? Uh, and so we have two artists who are doing this, so 19, born in 1950 and currently living and working today. And then the art historical artist is Edward Munch, who is born December 12th, 1863 in Norway. And he had the hardest life I have ever heard in my entire life. I mean, that's not true. There's been a lot of hard stories to hear, but this poor guy, I mean, oh, somebody's talking and we can't hear. All right, now I think everyone's muted. Okay, so born in Norway, and then he has all these brothers, sisters, mother, father, and one by one, they just start passing away. In um, Oslo, his mother died of tuberculosis, then his sister died of tuberculosis, and then his other sister ended up in an institution because of all of these deaths, and then his only brother dies at the age of 30 from pneumonia, and then a few laters after that, years later, in uh, 1889, his father dies, and he's not doing well emotionally. He is emotionally unstable. He is drinking a lot. He is institutionalized after a, a point of time. Um, but during this time, he is painting figures um, that are describing the emotions that he's feeling. So he's dealing with melancholy, anxiety, jealousy, despair, um, the cry, these last moments of, of death that he's experiencing. And he uh, has a hard time with female relationships. He has a hard time with alcohol. And uh, his whole family is dying right and left, and he's just in a lot of pain. So the power from his work and during those paintings, some of which we're going to look at today, really describe the emotion. Now, other pieces to know about Munch is the, um, he, he worked with Bonard for a short time. So I've taught Bonard in the past. I talk about him all the time. He's one of my favorite painters. And you can see some elements of his work. He didn't stay too long with him, just about four months. Uh, but he had a couple trips to Paris, one that was a trip and one that ended up lasting about three years. But you can see some of the influence in his mark making in Bonard. He was also very influenced by, you know, we're talking about Impressionism. He was very much influenced by Gauguin, and you can see some of those influences as well. So these first paintings that we're looking at, um, I want you to think about number one, the tone, so the lights and darks, and how, to, how those lights and darks are pushed throughout the painting. And um, we, we have two, I'm not sure if there's another figure in this Munch painting over here, but over here we have a single figure. And, you know, they're both painting their time. They, uh, Eric Fischel, you have to, he grew up in a time where it says specifically, an upbringing provided him with a backdrop of alcoholism and a country club culture obsessed with image over content. So, you know, California life and these people uh, attending art fairs and these people who are at these pool parties who are over-sexualized, maybe not over-sexualized, that's up to you to decide. Um, but the figurative work, very much narrative, people interacting in interesting ways. And in this one, um, we have more of a shadowy color to these two pieces. Um, more, the more popular work, the work that Eric Fischel got famous for, was these beach paintings. Uh, I, could, I could have compared him to a lot of people. I could have compared him to uh, Graham Nixon last week with all the bather paintings. I could compare him to, who's the other one I was thinking of? Darn, I forgot just now. Shoot, okay, it'll come back to me. But, uh, you know, if you look at this painting, what we have, and we know that Eric Fischel uses photographs, he paints from photographs, and he takes stills, and at some point he even bought, uh, hired models, hired actors to act out scenes within a house, and he took photographs of that, which created another body of work. But this is the work that he really got famous for and well known for. They're edgy in the sense that there's 
nude figures. I guess it's apparently edgy to be painting figures at all in 2019. So if you're a figure painter, you're edgy. And, and th this was met with a lot of discussion when I lived in New York, you know, is figure painting dead? Do I have to be an abstract painter to succeed? And when you look at these works, I think the answer is no, you do not have to be an abstract painter to succeed. There's very, there's a place and there's space for abstract work and there's a place and a space for figure painting, in my opinion. And I don't think narrative figure painting is ever going to get old because it talks to us. It uh, deals with these emotions that we know, that we've been through. And that is why Munk is one of the most famous artists in the world to have ever walked the earth because he, hits those emotional strings in you that you see in the paintings. Eric Fischel does a similar thing. You know, they're mysterious. You've got people doing all these different things and you can make up all different kinds of narratives for these stories. I don't think he even has a specific narrative, but it's really more about creating mystery and this movement of the figure. Very important to him that he has people in mid action. They're not just still but her hair is blowing, there's a twist, there's a blur, you know, there's things happening where it's not just a still figure, they're walking, they're swimming, they're running, they're turning. And then Munk, um, he definitely has figures that are doing things in, in the imagery, but not as much more straightforward or sitting, bending. So you'll take note of the difference of those and, um, Multiple figures is another point to bring up. So let's go to the next one. Uh, over here we have one of the more famous paintings by Munch. I still hear somebody. Um, I don't know how to make that one. Okay, so oops. No, not yet. Okay, so here we have two paintings. Uh, this one is a very melancholy moment of the mother his mother caring for his sister at the moment that she is about to pass away and she is very sick and ill. And if you've ever experienced grief and death in your lifetime, um, this painting may have a much more powerful feeling to you than uh, for other people who maybe have not experienced that yet. So when I first encountered these paintings, I was, I think I cried right along with the paintings. They were so powerful and I had been going through my own grief. And so I think these really speak to humanness. They really speak to the emotions that we're dealing with. And then Eric Fischel is really speaking to a humanist in a different way, speaking to those quiet moments where we're just going about our daily life, we're spending a day at the beach, we're living in our home, we're making coffee, we're sitting with our dog, we're having a conversation with our partner, um, things like that. So there's these moments, again, you have the feeling in Eric Fischel's work that they're in passing, those two men are passing each other, there's movement and action. Um, but the way he's applied the paint is not as moving as the painting on the left, where you can feel the movement by the strokes, by the way that he's applied the paint and the color, and by the color that he's used. Red and green, complementary colors. So he's used red and green in this painting, and there's a lot of viridian, which is currently my favorite color, and he uses that green in such an interesting way. Um, so in a way, to me, I feel like Edward Munch's paintings have more movement than the paintings on the right, um, even though their figures are actually moving within the painting. But uh, all of these are these painters, you know, exceptional painting quality, but I do definitely get the feeling of a photograph. And sometimes, even as I was pulling some of these images off the internet, I couldn't tell if they were photographs or paintings when they were super small. So that's um, something to think about if you always use photographs in your work, is that we can tell a lot of times. It looks like a photograph. There's a very different quality that happens from looking at something from real life and looking at a photograph. The main thing I notice is more flatness. I see more flatness in his work than I do in Munch's work because I know that this is from photographs, maybe multiple photographs put together 
Um, I do really love the layout here of how we have this foreground, closer figures, all the way to these deep space figures. There's just a very crowded beach day. And um, if you live in California and you've been to the beach in the summer, it definitely has this sort of feeling. But we get the, mom the feeling that we're just stuck in this moment with them which is kind of exciting. We get to sit in that moment and maybe think about what it feels like to be there. Um, and again, we have the brushwork of Munch, completely different quality, line quality. You can see some influence of Gauguin and Bonnard and just you know Impressionism in general, maybe even some Kandinsky in there. Um, and the way that these two people are painting bathers on the beach in completely different ways, but also, you get the feeling that you're caught in a moment in time and you get to experience that moment with them. Now, some of these Eric Fischel pieces get a little tough and so do, um, so do, oopsie, so do Eric Fischel's. We have these more intense emotional moments that we are pulled into in a different way between the two of them. Um, there's underlying diagonals in these pieces. Uh, the one on the right is more obvious. You can see the diagonal of the, I don't know if it's a person or if it's a sculpture and a kid in a museum hiding under the sculpture. I'm not quite sure what's going on. And it's really funny. There was There is a video that I posted, I believe, uh, by Eric Fischel. Uh, and they're interviewing people who are looking at the paintings in the gallery and every single person tells a different story about what they see. Oh, I see a man and a woman having a fight and she's under a net and this person's hiding and it's a completely different story. So there's more mystery to Eric Fischel's work uh, because he doesn't give us as clear of a narrative and I think that's another piece that makes his work really interesting is the mystery that is played out and you can just circle around over and over this painting and you're wondering you know what are those sculptures in the corner on the wall what is this figure is this a sculpture or is it a human actually laying there is this a kid or is this a woman is, is he picking his nose is he sucking his thumb I don't know I don't know what's going on, but it's interesting. And um, I think that's the basis for a good painting is being able to look at a painting for more than 10 seconds. You have to consider that the viewer is gonna look at your painting for less than 10 seconds in a museum. So if you want them to look at your painting for more than 10 seconds, you need to create mystery, you need to create um, composition that keeps bringing you back into the space and getting you to think about what's going on and have more than you know one single fi figure floating in the middle of the room. You've got to have some narrative here. So both of these painters are narrative. They're dealing with the emotional aspects of humanness. There's this uh, deep human feeling going on here. We have um, another grieving moment going on with his family as another member of the family has just passed away and you can see just, you know, this figure in the back, how he's leaning against the wall and he's got his head down. They've all got their heads tilted slightly down because they're mourning. They are in mourning and they are sad. You can see it, the looks on their faces. Everyone's just realized, okay, you know, these are the last moments or this is it. And they're grieving and they're in silence. Nobody's talking. Nobody's looking at each other. Um, and we don't have all the figures. We don't have the figure in the bed described for us. We don't have the person sitting in the chair fully described for us. So there's mystery within mystery within mystery in these paintings, but also clear understanding of the humanness that we feel when we look at them and the emotion that we feel when we look at these paintings. And it takes a lot more than 10 seconds to talk about them, that's for sure. See what time it is, I have no idea. And they don't have my phone. Okay, I got 10 minutes. Um, another grieving piece up above. Um, we've got a man laying in the bed this time, and then we have people laying, or a woman, I don't know, um, people laying over, standing over, excuse me. But the, um, the movement, even in the wallpaper on Munch's piece, in the light source, this sort of green mood that's going on. We have a bit of green mood in both of these pieces, actually. And 
Um, the fun thing about looking at art history paintings is that you can sort of pick out what was going on at the time. Um, and same thing with uh, current day political figurative paintings, if anyone's caught on to what's going on in the bottom piece here. And I'm, I don't know the full story of this painting because he doesn't even know the full story of his paintings. He uses moments, stills, um, moments in time that he pieces together and uh, sort of creates an inside outside world um, and we have a man and a little girl, and then they're obviously in a little girl's room, and there's some interesting artwork on the wall and a black dress hanging on the door, and there's no mother. So uh, these dolls aren't looking too happy either, and we have Donald Trump back here dressed as a clown. So I didn't make the painting. Don't judge, don't judge the messenger. I'm just telling you what I see in the paintings. And I think the Viridians, I think the story, they're both inside someone's room. Um, I've really been into that lately, inside people's rooms. I've been painting my own bedroom, my, out my window, out my bathroom, um, because I think our intimate spaces are a very important place for us to learn and paint from and maybe use in our compositions. Um, this is just a darker, moment for Eric Fischel. He's usually a much brighter painter, so it's nice to see his light change in a variety of ways. I do not love his application of paint. Uh, it's a little too thin for me. I'm, I like thick paintings. I like paintings to not look like photographs, and there's a very fine line here for me, but uh, to each his own, and I try not to put in too much of my personal belief system, but I can't help it, so neither can they. And um, here's another melancholy moment of a sunset and, and these people walking along this bridge, and this bridge and sunset may look very familiar to you for a following piece, the most famous piece that we know. Um, but um, Eric Fischel also says, I'm, I don't see color. He says, I don't see color. I put all of my, I don't see in color shapes, basically. I do see in color shapes, and I could pick out each one of you who sees in color shapes in my classes, too, because I can just see the way you apply uh, the color in shape or the way that you see it. And so he says he puts all of his paints out onto the palette. And he says it's a huge waste because half the time I don't use most of the paint on the palette, but I need to have it out anyway. And I fully agree with that belief system. You should have all of your palette set up every single time with the paint that you're going to use, whether you're going to use the colors or not. I would say find uh, 15 to 20 colors, use those colors until you know them inside, outside, backwards, and know what each color mixes. He also says he just likes the way all the blobs of paint look on the palette together. It looks like a candy store, he says. So um, <clears throat> again, we have these extremely human moments going on. We have a look, you know, a peek into this conversation with this woman. We don't see what the other person looks like. You can see his hand and she's maybe handing him, uh, maybe he's handing her a napkin to wipe the tear from her eye, but we don't really know if she's crying. It looks like there's a tear, but there's a million stories that we could all, we could all sit down and write, chat in and write what we think the story is about, and I bet we'll have, you know, 20 different answers. Um, again, both of these artists really like green. Look at all the, look at the green windows back there. Very, these green lights coming through the corners of these windows, and then it's bouncing off of these leaves up here. That's a very smart move compositionally. Same with this yellow light, bouncing yellow light, bouncing yellow light off of his watch, and even all the way off of the painting. So you can uh, uh, see that the, there is an understanding of color and composition and, and just quality of work. Um, obviously, he's a good painter. Obviously, Munk is a good painter. Um, I mean, technically, I would say Eric Fischel probably has maybe more draftsman or rendering skill than Munch, but I don't think Munch was concerned with that. He's more concerned with the emotion that's being pulled out of the, the painting. And again, we have a green painting and we have a house in the distance and a tree in front of that. And then these two people 
who are sort of dissolving into each other, looking at each other. We don't know, they don't look like they're talking, but they're sharing a heartache kind of moment. And um, we know that Munk didn't have the best relationships with women. He sort of was scared of women. He had a few relationships, they didn't go well. Um, and then he would turn to alcohol. And uh, at the end of his um, alcohol driven, grief stricken life, he turned himself into a asylum and he ended up getting um, electromagnetic shock therapy which after he left, he didn't drink anymore. For the next 35 years of his life, he quit drinking, he started painting again, his depression was not as bad. Um, and also it is said maybe that his paintings are not as potent because of that. So, you know, if you have grief and pain in your life, harness that energy and put it into your paintings. You can see the power that's coming from the pain in this work. So pain can often be something really beautiful can come out of it if you allow for that. And he did really prolong his alcoholism and his bad relationships and his grief for longer than he probably should have uh, because he didn't want to lose the potency of his work. So very interesting um, sort of thought there, but you know, if you're an artist and you have mental illness of some sort, uh, you maybe understand that sort of feeling that you can't, um, you know, if you take medication, it, it will change your paintings. So you gotta decide, I guess. Um, this is one of the ones of Eric Fischel's where he's hired a couple of actors and he's um, rented a home and he did photographs of them doing different things, acting out scenarios to create more narrative. Uh, and he didn't really know what the narrative would come out, what narrative would come out, but it turns out that these um, narratives do have sort of a melancholy and sad feeling about the relationship. And uh, then in the end, he says that the, he didn't understand, he felt horrible that this was happening and he kind of didn't want to make these paintings anymore because they were about these sad relationships. And he didn't know why, because he had a happy marriage. And then um, the models, the actors told him that, um, that they were going through breakups or you know personal stuff that was melancholy. So it's almost as if their life unfolded in front of the camera without him realizing what was going on and then he used those photographs to make paintings like this and um it has a melancholy feel to it we have two empty chairs we have two empty uh, stands we have a dog swimming to her and she's in a pool in a black dress which could be a lot of things it could be mourning and here maybe we have more mourning over here um, or, you know, something going on with the personal relationship, but these two people are hugging and there's a lot of black in this painting and just the bits of light. I think compositionally thinking about the way the light is coming across the image on both of them, it's normally left to right. More light on the left and less light on the right. I guess that's just um, maybe the light in California or the light, um, light source that they both chose for some reason. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have the Scream, since most people know this artist because of this painting, the Scream, and uh, you know, you're in kindergarten, you learn about this painting, but really the Scream man is supposedly represents the emotion of the sunset, so um, it is sort of the feeling that you got from looking at the sunset anthropomorphized, if that's the right word. That's all I have to say. This is uh, Eric Fischel's, one of the other, um, I don't remember actually if it's the beach scene or if it's the uh, inside house actors. Kind of looks like that actress. Either way, figurative work, um, interesting narrative, good composition, light sources that carry us throughout the compositions, um, diagonals, uh, subtle diagonals going on, pathways, figurative work used to describe the emotions and the moments of human life. Ta-da! Let me hear your comments. Anybody? You want to type in a comment? You're welcome to type in the chat section. You're welcome to take yourself off mute now 
and um, let me know how you feel about these two artists. Anybody? Unmute, chat, no? Okay, and then since no one wants to talk to me, you can go to comments right here. I also left a video under comments. Let me just quickly, it's 9.30, but I left a video. I know this takes a little while to load now because we have so many comments. Maybe I'll have to start a new comment section pretty soon. We're gonna overwhelm this little Padlet guy. Um, okay, it's not loading, but um, I posted a video on the golden section an eight minute video by a artist teacher who really describes this guy right here, video on sacred geometry, Myron Barnstone. Apparently he has an online class about sacred geometry in art. So maybe you wanna sign up for that and let me know if you do, cause I wanna know about it and I might do it as well. Cause I think it sounds fascinating. Um, so Myron Barnstone, eight minute video on last week's golden rectangle. I'm also going to upload the video for last week. It did record and I am recording this session successfully. So hooray. I will see you all next week. I, once I have the, which one was it? Uh, Piero de la Francesca and Graham Nixon video up. I will one email you two. It will be on the YouTube channel and three. It will be at the very bottom of this. Right now I have the old one. I'm going to replace it with the new one at the bottom of the section. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.